we have all been concerned as well by the Russian Ukraine invasion and uh, its impact even on Ghana. You know what His Excellency the President said? Every drop that the Russians drop, it impacts us in Ghana, even in our pockets. So imagine the people of Ukraine themselves who are being impacted directly by the Russian invasion. This morning, I'm fortunate to have in the studio uh, Tatiana uh, Peshonshi, if I got the pronunciation right. She's the head of the Human Rights Center, Zmina, uh, joining me in the studio to talk about, you know, the plight of, uh, you know, the people in Ukraine, giving us a sense of what the realities are, because all we read about is in the news, video images, but as to the real situation on the ground, she would paint that for us. Tatiana, it's good to have you in the studio. Good morning. Thank you for me. I'm hoping you're doing well. Yes, thank you. All right, so tell us, what's the situation in Ukraine now? As human rights defenders working on the ground, uh, mm. we fix huge amount of war crimes and crimes against humanity happening in the course of the Russian aggression. Mm. And these are just not just uh, you know single casualties that could happen in every war, but we see that Russia uh, deliberately is targeting civilians and uh, committing the war crimes in mass. Mm. At the moment, Prosecutor General Office of Ukraine uh, registered 38,000 of criminal proceedings based mm. on the facts of war crimes, and this is not. A the final number because every day they uh, open plus 100 plus 200 new mm. cases because the war is on the active uh, hot stage now you speak about war crimes what forms do they take these war crimes you speak of yeah they are different types of war crimes mm. these are uh, the murders and extrajudicial killings of civilians uh, also uh, deliberately targeting infrastructure especially schools kindergartens res residential areas by russian rockets and uh, kamikaze drones but also these are cases of torture of sexual violence um, many cases of looting and other the gravest international uh, crimes which we document mm. and collect so they uh, will be investigated in future interesting let's talk about the welfare of the people we'll come to the war itself but let's talk about the welfare of the people the young men who have had to run the women who are looking for shelter the refugees in other countries how is life in ukraine um, it's very difficult because one third of the population uh, had to flee. Uh, either they displaced, are displaced either inside inside the country or mm. moved abroad. This uh, is 13 million uh, of Ukrainians, including my parents-in-law. Uh, our house in Irpin near Kiev uh, was uh, destroyed, partially destroyed by the mm. Russian uh, Rus Russian munition. Mm. So it, it affects uh, every Ukrainian uh, family, uh, but uh, especially uh, uh, women and children uh, who suffer, uh, among others, a lot from, from the consequences of this uh, invasion. Should we be here in the first place, casting our minds back to the commencement of this war? and the warnings Russia had given. Should we be here? Should there have been a war in the first place? Uh, if this, this should be at the first place because uh, it is not only about Russia and Ukraine uh, and uh, also I would like to remind that Ukraine is a democracy but Russia is authoritarian state so it's a also war of uh, two systems of values mm -hmm. but it also has uh, global implications and impact on the uh, rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Ghana we met uh, different uh, interlocutors yesterday and the day before yesterday mm -hmm. including farmers, including businessmen, civil society organizations and a lot of them uh, a lot of people here told us how uh, prices uh, uh, have grown up and also uh, the inflation uh, rate which is very high here this year expected to be very high in Ghana uh, fuel prices energy prices so every, everything is getting very expensive because of uh, this war because Russia started its aggression against Ukraine now there are those who would say that but for the initiations of Zelensky, President Zelensky, and the warnings from President Putin to hasten slowly, we would not be here. After all, prior to the invasion, Ukraine had been Ukraine, regardless of Russia's attempt to, you know, uh, try to, uh, what's the word, get some part of Ukraine, there had been that seeming peace there. So I ask again, 
should we be here in the first place? You know, this war started not on 24th of February. It started mm. in 2014 when Russia occupied the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea and started its war in Donbass. And before it, in 2013, Ukraine was a non-bloc non country. We didn't plan to join NATO. Mm -hmm. Like, And moreover, Ukraine uh, was uh, used to have a nuclear power, nucle uh, nu nuclear weapon. And uh, uh, Ukraine is uh, vol voluntarily gave its nuclear nuclear weapon in 1994. Uh, in, instead, Ukraine received guarantees of territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty from, mm. from three countries, basically from the USA, UK, and third guarantor was Russia. Mm. So basically, just in 20 years, one of the countries that guaranteed Ukraine uh, territorial integrity attacked Ukraine and uh, annexed, uh, illegally annexed part of the Ukrainian territories. Mm. But when uh, President Zelensky was elected, actually, he tried to make some, like, peace negotiations with Putin mm. and his, it, this was his one of his slogans during his pres presidential campaign. Mm. But we see that in two years uh, that didn't help to, you know, prevent another attack. So uh, Russia is totally imperialistic uh, state that want to colonize us, that want to restore the uh, Russian empire or new mo form of USSR. And Ukrainian people are not willing to follow this track, mm. definitely not willing to follow. So if, if Ukraine had shelved the whole idea of joining NATO, what now, would have happened? Yeah, now, you know, now uh, the support for joining NATO in, in Ukraine is very big mm. uh, due to opinion polls. But this is just, uh, as I said, in, to, in 2013, before Russia attacked Ukraine, mm. uh, there were, it was not popular at all. And we hope that our not block, block status will help us, you know, to, to live in a peace with all our neighbors. Mm. But now people see that uh, uh, it didn't help and it didn't prevent uh, the attack. So people want uh, to seek at least some form of protection which they think that NATO if Ukraine joins the NATO then will have uh, you know peace on a long term uh, but uh, the NATO is not very much willing to you know take us on board so mm. that is also true now let's talk about the geography and the culture between Ukrainians and Russians on a normal day what's the relationship uh, well, you know, historically uh, we are different Slavic people like uh, uh, Polish people or Czech people, so these are different Sla Slavic uh, nations. Mm. Uh, Ukraine is five centuries older than Russia and actually the Kievan Rus big medieval kingdom started from, from Kiev in Ukraine and mm. there was nothing on the place of, of Moscow, only forests. Mm. So uh, now, uh, like we, uh, all these like decades we lived in peace. Uh, but Russia is uh, in a mind its empire and uh, they want to uh, expand its territories by uh, attacking the uh, other uh, neighboring countries. And we uh, and one of the reasons why it's happening to us is also the impunity because uh, Russians were involved uh, in the war not only in Ukraine committing a lot of war crimes but mm. also in Syria uh, and also uh, the Russian mercenaries were involved here in Africa, in Central African mm. Republic, in Mali. Uh, they committed murder, rape, tortures and uh, no accountability for that so they have their hands free you know to attack and to commit this again and again so for us it's crucial there would be an accountability for what they did not only those perpetrators who committed war crimes on the ground their commanders who gave them orders mm -hmm. but also top leadership of the Russian Federation Russian president Vladimir Putin minister Shoigu and others who are war criminals who basically uh, gave orders and commands to both bombard Ukrainian cities without no military purpose, mm. just to make a suffer and pain for civilians to terrify people because they cannot, uh, you know, win on the military field. Now, there are those who hold the view that the West failed Ukraine. If the armaments that have come, maybe the last two months, had come earlier, yeah. would not be here. Do you share that view? Yeah, I, I share that view and actually in the first days and weeks uh, of this large-scale invasion we were calling uh, all our like partners abroad, uh, reaching the governments of, of the EU, EU, USA, asking us to provide as soon as possible uh, the military equipment uh, to defend ourselves. Mm. But uh, this, uh, uh, this support is coming, but coming slowly. Mm. So if we have this uh, ammunition and equipment that we are receiving now, half a year ago, mm. that would help to prevent uh, much more casualties and to save, to save more people's lives. Mm. Now, 
Are the people in Ukraine upbeat? Because we've been reading in the news about how Ukrainian soldiers have been able to reclaim some cities which had been annexed by Russia. Are they upbeat that in, in the end, those which have been annexed, they'll be able to reclaim them with the support that the U.S. is giving and the promises that President Biden has made in terms of supplying armaments for Ukraine? Yeah, you know, for us, it's the only solution is uh, restoring all territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine, uh, mm. including occupied Crimea, controlled over uh, Crimean Peninsula. Mm. And uh, the simple reason why for us it's like a solution, because uh, we saw that uh, in 2014, Russia already annexed Crimea and Russia started its war in Donbass, but that didn't stop them to move for, to moving forward. Mm -hmm. So even one, if one piece of Ukrainian territory remains under the control of the Russian troops, for us that means that they will maybe recalculate their mistakes, they will use time to prevent another attack. Mm -hmm. And maybe even not on us, uh, uh, they, they could attack Moldova, they could attack Baltic states, other states. So Russia in, in its nature is an aggressive country. Mm -hmm. And the only way for us of survival is to restore our territorial integrity and also uh, the, the strategy of the West is also to de deweaponize Russia, to put sanctions so Russian war machine cannot effectively pump up and uh, cannot continue this war and new attacks. Mm. Now, if you look at Russia's attempt at conscript and the protests as well within Russia today, how do you feel about the protests going on in Russia, though it's been resisted? You know, these protests are very weak because uh, in 20 years of uh, Putin's presidency, he destroyed the civil society and free media in Russia. It's a global crackdown of, of human rights and this uh, internal uh, oppression made, po made possible external aggression. Mm -hmm. So there were some protests, but we see that uh, they are not making any crucial change and uh, a lot of conscripted men are being sent to the battlefield without like uh, any, uh, any training. Uh, so they are, you know, quickly killed and uh, which is, is more terrible for me that Russia is conscripting also Ukrainians from mm -hmm. the occupied territories like Crimea or part of the Donbass to fight for Russia, mm -hmm. which is a war crime because occupying country cannot conscript the population yeah. of the occupied territory to mm -hmm. its own army. But Russia is doing that, especially in Crimea. Uh, Russia is conscripting Crimean Tatars. These are indigenous people of Crimea, a Crimean minority, Crimean natives mm -hmm. that lived in Crimea many, many centuries uh, before, you know, and also suffering from Russia. During the Stalin times, they were, the, all people, Crimean Tatars were deported to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, to Central Asia. The whole nation was deported by Stalin. So they suffered a lot from Russia during their history and then when they came back to Crimea in 90s now they are experiencing another wave of oppression now the talk about war crimes do you think President Putin ever will face the justice system for these war crimes you speak of because if indeed for instance the world wanted to go or the West wanted to go an all-out war, would have seen it by now. Would he ever face? Yeah, he has to if he's still alive by that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that now Ukrainian case is uh, being investigated in the International Criminal Court in mm -hmm. The Hague, and they send the investigators who work on the ground and who document everything happening in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, a week ago on Monday, it was a huge uh, attack on Ukraine, on 20 Ukrainian cities with 84 Russian rockets and 24 kamikaze drones. And this was uh, purely against civilian population, no military targets at all, which is clear war crime. And Putin uh, in Russian television said that they, they reached out their goals. So basically, uh, he admitted the responsibility for these uh, huge mass war crimes. And the ICC investigators uh, during this attack were hiding together with Ukrainians in bomb shelters. And Karim Khan, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, said that the ICC would investigate this crime, which for me has clear, you know, allegations of who who is standing behind that. But the problem is that in the ICC it could take five, ten years before, you know, before the, the trial. We don't know what happens with Putin by that. We don't know what happens with Russia. So now it's very important to su support Ukrainian society and Ukrainian military so we can win this, this war and we can release our territories. Now, 
the people of Russia themselves, as to how President Putin will wield so much power, do you as Ukrainians ever wonder how yeah. there isn't any revolt by the people of Russia who are seemingly, from some of us who have not been there, we see them as fierce. Why haven't they revolted or are they happy with Mr. Putin? It looks like the vast majority is happy with Putin, but uh, the more this war lasts, the more questions they uh, start to ask. Uh, because uh, uh, ordinary Russians now are being mobilized and conscripted to the army and mm. uh, you know every almost every or every second Ukrainian family has relatives in Russia like my family too my relatives our relatives live in Moscow region mm. and you know they support Putin they support this bloody war for us we just stopped communicating with them because we were trying to explain what Russian army did in Irpin in Bucha uh, where like my husband parents live uh, and uh, but they they said it's not true we know better from our te te television mm. what happened. Mm. They they don't want to listen us who experienced all these uh, uh, crimes. So uh, I think it's a power of, power of Russian propaganda because they were so heavily brainwashed during the decades. Uh, and this is not only a propaganda, fake news. This is also about fueling a hate speech, hatred against Ukrainians. So they deny the very existence of the Ukrainian nation. They uh, even historically in the Russian Empire, they called us Malarosa, little Russians. So they, they want to dare Ukraine, Ukrainianize, Ukrainianize Ukraine, which is, you know, a clear signs of, of genocide. And that is uh, the initial goal of Mr. Putin and the real reason of starting this war. Hmm. Your family is in Russia and they don't believe you. The issue of propaganda. The Russians have also accused Ukraine of propaganda. And so between your side and the Russian side, who do we believe? Because the West seems to be on your side, propagating what is seemingly the atrocities of Russia. But the people of Russia are also being shown what is seemingly the atrocities of Ukraine yeah. So, them, so who do we believe? You know, That's just line. to equate Russia and Ukraine and say that the, the, there are propaganda from both sides mm. is just to equate the victim and, and aggressor. Mm. You know, a woman that is being raped and rapist and says that, you know, women which, which is screaming is propaganda. Mm. And this is a very easy way uh, how to make your own assessment. Just come to Ukraine. There are a huge amount of media who are working in Ukraine, mm. uh, who are traveling to this liberated area, who are telling the stories from the ground. The best way is just to come to Ukraine and see it with own eyes mm. or ask people who live there, like us who came from Kiev, to tell what is happening in Ukraine. I think it's very important to dismantle all that like fake narratives and to report uh, in the objective way what is happening. Now, we'll be ending our conversation shortly, but l let's focus our attention, uh, the last bit of the conversation on the women and the children. Because I'm, I'm asking myself, I know recently there was that trade agreement for, you know, ships carrying cereals and other food uh, to cross that street, Russia agreed to it. Initially, there were some issues there in there, but I know finally they agreed. I'm looking at how women and children are coping. Food, shelter, transportation, basic amenities. How are they coping? You know, this war is especially painful for women and children. Mm. And uh, there are a, a lot of uh, like a gender biased vi violence during this war. Like I mentioned, uh, a lot of cases of sexual mm. violence, not only against uh, women, but also against children. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, largely hidden because uh, usually the victims do not report the sexual abuse. It's very mm. difficult for them. But we have uh, uh, several, several dozens of cases which are already investigated by the prosecutors of sexual violence, including five cases of rape of children, mm. uh, starting from four, 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 four years age. And also 400 U Ukrainian children were already killed, eight more hundred uh, children were uh, wounded, uh, 2,500 Ukrainian schools and kindergartens were uh, uh, damaged, and out of mm. them 300 were destroyed. And in Ukraine, those children who go to school, usually they, go, they also need to go to bomb shelters when there is an air uh, uh, alarm mm. and uh, this is not only about some you know uh, crimes committed in a physical way against children and women but also a, a huge psychological impact 
that, uh, you know, we will feel uh, on the level of generation for, for these children which are traumatized by the effects of this war. Now, what sort of support are they receiving? Uh, we receive, uh, uh, the, the most important support that we receive is, as a country is, uh, first of all, financial support because uh, our economy uh, uh, in this year uh, dropped by one third, but we need uh, funds, money to pay uh, salaries for teachers, uh, for doctors, for, to pay pensions. So very important fi financial support. Second is a military support because mm. uh, we need to liberate our territories. And the third, uh, which is very important, is sanctions because mm. uh, uh, this undermines the Russian war machine and prevents it from, uh, you know, escalating and aggravating the situation and preparing new attacks on Ukraine. But, but the, the, the issue of sanctions, someone would say if it would have worked, by now the Russian machinery should be down. But Russia is receiving support. Recently, I was reading the story of Belarus. Russia constantly is trading. Russia so constantly is getting armaments. You know, the push of the Chinese and the North. These are all countries that are positioning themselves also to take advantage of the situation. Also to showcase their own issues with the nations that Russia is supposedly fighting. Not necessarily Ukraine. United States of America, the UK, and the rest of them. So there's still support. Will these sanctions in any way yield any results? Yeah, you know, Russia is challenging the trade change and the, all the rules of trade which were established after the Second World War. And Russia is using its uh, energy supply as a uh, uh, like method of blackmailing others, as you mentioned, not only Ukraine, but also other countries. Russia wants to uh, freeze us in the winter, uh, attacking our uh, electric power plants and uh, the chains of uh, electricity su supply. So it's a clear, you know, that Russia was recognized a terrorist state by the uh, Council of Europe, by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and uh, this another resolution about recognizing Russia a terrorist state will be voted by the European Parliament. We hope that also it will be done on the level of, of the EU. And we see that uh, sanctions are having impact on the Russian economy. It will also drop uh, uh, by the uh, end of this year from 5 till to, to 10 percent uh, mm. minus G G in terms of GDP. So it's, it's a huge impact on Russian economy, but uh, the longer time we have, the more devastating it will be for, uh, for the Russian Federation. It's interesting, but even in all this, the citizens of Russia still support, majority of them still support Vladimir Putin. Now, the intent, the ultimate goal for the sanctions is virtually to render the economy crippled. And it is then that the people, the citizens themselves, are going to feel the pinch as the heat, the unbearable heat they have to deal with. Then they will start speaking against the government as to the essence of the war. But if with all these sanctions that are still in place, the people are still in support of their president, then something might be missing out there. Actually, the level of support of Putin is dropping from the end uh, of summer. And with this uh, mobilization, conscription to the Russian army, uh, the, uh, you know, the drop is even uh, bigger. Mm. So I think it will have an effect on the long term. And uh, Russians also will suffer uh, in economic terms from, but, from but, but these that sanctions. And that means that also in, on a long term perspective, less and less people will support. Putin. But this long term that you speak of, has Ukraine got that time for that long term scene that now? It's personal. Yeah. It's drones against civilians. Do you have that time for that long term for us, goal? For us, it's also very difficult and tough because we have the hole in our budget, uh, 5 billion uh, US dollars every month. Mm. And we need ha somehow to find this money and to refill it. So uh, basically, we are receiving the financial support and uh, either loans or grants from international uh, financial institutions and from foreign countries. But yes, you're right. For us, it's very, very tough. But we, uh, for us, it's a matter of uh, uh, the very existence of the Ukrainian state. So we will do everything possible to survive and to get through this war. I'll, gi I'll give you last two last questions. One has to do with the end in sight for the war. Is there an end in sight for this war? 
uh, the, the end is very simple. Uh, the end is when Russia withdraws its troops from the territory of Ukraine, from its rec internationally recognized borders. Mm. Do, you, do you think this is going to escalate into a nuclear matter? Because that's the, what the world is afraid of. Yeah. That's what the West is afraid of, that this would become a matter of a nuclear war. And if you gauge the posture of the Russians, that's where they want the world to go. Yeah. Is that where we are headed towards? That is very, uh, would be very terrible situation, mm. uh, not only for us, uh, and especially having uh, also Chernobyl uh, uh, in, in, in our territory. I was mm. born in the Chernobyl polluted area, so I know uh, how devastating are the results uh, of, of, of such situation. Mm. And ra now it looks like Russia is more threatening because uh, they also know that response from the West will be very painful. The army can be destroyed uh, totally. And this uh, war then uh, will be really not uh, between Russia and Ukraine, but uh, between Russia and the rest uh, of the, uh, like the world democratic countries. Mm. So Russia now uh, occupied the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant which is the biggest uh, in, in, in the Europe and uh, this is the first time in the history when the nuclear power plant is being occupied mm. and Russia is uh, threatening also uh, with some explosions uh, and uh, so one of our here the goals is also to uh, gain more international support to convince Russia to withdraw, it, withdraw its troops from the territory of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant mm. and to demilitarize the zone uh, in the vicinity of uh, this nuclear power plant. Is it too late for a diplomatic solution to this problem? Is it too late for a diplomatic solution to this problem? As President Zelensky said, we are ready for diplomatic solution, but with uh, the next president of the Russian Federation. Uh, Vladimir Putin already committed so uh, huge number of the gravest crime. He is basically a war criminal and a terrorist. He, co he converted Russia in a terroristic state, and this is very difficult to negotiate with terrorists. I thank you, Tatiana, for joining me this morning. Your Ukrainian folks are listening. Your Russian family members are also listening and watching because i know definitely the embassy is here and so they would follow the conversation what would be your final words to anybody who might be watching today yes i just uh, wanted to say that uh, we as ukrainians we need to stop this war and we need a justice and uh, impunity is a key issue why russia is continuing this uh, aggressive uh, attacks mm. so we really need to bring them to justice to the hague and then uh, we'll receive a sustainable peace i'm grateful you joined me this morning tatiana